What's going on, guys? I'm your host, Aaron Lloyd, and this is episode 58. 58 of the Creation Grounds. We are almost at 60 episodes. It's bananas. It's crazy. Before I get into our next illustrious guest, I want to encourage you, yes, you, to like, share, subscribe, tell people about the podcast. They'll be inspired, motivated, educated, and all of that. And if you've been rocking with me this long, I appreciate you. And if you're just joining, welcome. My next guest, Marlon Campbell, has worked with Woody King at New Federal Theater. He works in all aspects of theater, from set design, he's done lighting, he does props and scenic design, um, at stage management, and he's currently an executive director at the Theater of the Living Word. He also works at the Caribbean American Repertory Theater. And in this episode, he tells stories about how he's traveled the world and what he's gained and the jewels of wisdom that he's gained from those travels and his experience. He gives some advice to up and coming actors or people that are in the arts um, on how they can maximize their gifts. He tells a great story about how Harlem was doing this production that they were taking overseas. They brought it to Japan and how just impactful that production was. It's a great story. He talks about Woody King speaking life into him and, and seeing something in him that he didn't and it turns out that it happened. So just the value of that and much, much more. Enjoy this episode with Marlon Campbell. Make sure you reach out to him at marlincampbell.com. Check out the Theater of the Living Word and also check out the Caribbean American Repertory Theater. Episode 58, let go. Welcome to another episode of the Creation Grounds. I have a talented, illustrious Marlon Campbell on with me. How you doing, Marlon? I'm fine and dandy this evening, Brother Lloyd. Thanks for having me with you this evening. For sure. So, what is your earliest memory of the arts? It happened uh, very specifically. I, I, I always like to sketch around. I, uh, I started as a, a visual artist. I liked to draw when I was a little boy. Uh, when I was in the fifth grade, we put on a school play. Uh, we put on The Wizard of Oz, and uh, I got to not only do some act, I played the wizard, uh, but I, I also got to paint scenery for the play. And, you know, I heard a pastor say the first things in and the last things out. Those those early experiences, I, I still think about those things today when I'm working on the set. That same kid painting something that was bigger than myself, and then so many people came to see it. Uh, it was interesting, interesting. It, uh, I have to pay tribute to the teacher who started us on that, Mr. Edward Meadow. He was His best friend was Lou Gossett, of all people. Wow. So I guess he came by it honestly. That's beautiful. Have you had a run-in with Lou? That's, that's a legend right there, Lou Gossett. I was only in a room with him once, but, uh, you know, uh, my childhood dream was to meet all the famous people, and I, I came to realize that the we all around each other all the time. I've seen some of my idols in the same room with me, and uh, it's really been a, a thrill along the way. Also, to know some folks who were at a humble point in their career and to see them rise to great heights, uh, it's, it's gratifying because I know the work that they put in. There's no overnight success that doesn't take years to occur. Yeah, man. And uh, just to give some people a background, you've worked... You've worked on Checkmates on Broadway. You helped. You did the set on that, correct? And that we worked. Uh, that was New Federal Theater. I did uh, the set decoration as well as the props. Uh, I've worked with NFT, uh, uh, Negro Ensemble Company. Uh, the done the opera. Uh, done some gospel musicals. I traveled the world for a while with uh, Vi Higginson's Mama, I Want to See. I was uh, first a technical director, then a production manager for that show. So uh, just about every company uh, and every venue that I, I wanted to try to get my elbow into, somehow or later, I was there, even Madison Square Garden. Uh, my dad really, for years, he thought it was just a weird hobby, but it wasn't until I finally played a show at the <laughs> Grand Old Opry. He was a huge country fan. He said, oh, my God, this is this thing must be real, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after that, he never gave me a headache about it again. I love it. Hard work pays off. So you you have all this experience. Um, do you have a moment in theater that that really sticks out to you as the most inspired piece of work that you've seen, and why? Uh, why did it inspire you the most? You know, there's there was a piece that was done. Woody King put together a show called Robert Johnson Trick the Devil about the late 
blues legend. And he was rumored to have gained his powers of play by making a deal with the devil at the crossroads. They put together a play that dealt with the last moments of his life. Uh, Guy Davis, Ozzy Davis's son, played Robert Johnson. And the set, and Denise Mickleberry played his love interest. The late Granaldo Frazier was on the piano. Uh, it's just a, an incredible production. And everything seemed so simple. The set design, the lighting was so simple, but we were able to tell the story so strongly that we ended up traveling all over the place with this show and touching a lot of people. But there's, there's another show that maybe maybe your listeners have never heard of. Uh, it's called Ulgu Num Nun Pak Dal Ja. It's a South Korean drama that I had an opportunity to work on at LaGuardia Community College. Their methods of setting scenes their lighting techniques were so influential. Uh, it's a demarcation point for how I did things before that experience and afterward. I love it. With that production, was it like, you know, the no theater and Kabuki? Was it kind of that stylized like that? It was, it was a, it, it, now, we did a show like that. I got to work with Sachio Ito, the legendary uh, uh, dance choreographer and lighting designer from Japan. But this show was a drama. But the scale of their sets, they used every inch of the, from the floor to the proscenium. Uh, they made it snow on stage by an extremely complicated Rube Goldberg thing with little cans of snow. And it was the saddest show ever. You know, you wait for the happy part. And it started off kind of sad and then got sadder and sadder as the show <laughs> went on. Uh, the crew was balling. We hardly understood it. But they had uh, uh, subtitles for folks from America that could, so they could follow along. Uh, it was just, it was just a, a unique experience. You got to step out of your culture sometimes to really latch on to something new. I love it. And Theater of the Living uh, Word, you've been involved with them for a while, What and they've been around for a while. What what makes you most proud about that theater and, and your involvement with them? Brother, you're so smart. You got to the point already, the idea of longevity, that the company has survived through many, many years and uh, continues vigorous or in some ways stronger than ever. Uh, I came to the company uh, when a friend of mine who was a lighting designer, he said, Marley, why don't you come to help me? help these old ladies put on a show. And the reason I can say that, because I'm older now than those so-called <laughs> old ladies that I went to help back in the day. Uh, a lady named Millicent Jones began the company, a, a, a woman of the arts. And uh, of, she was woke when everybody was still asleep <laughs> and made a company that would highlight the black experience, but particularly uh, female playwrights, female characters, and I am secretly Southeast Queens' most masculine feminist. So uh, I took to this idea very strongly, and I've done everything I can to promote that same zeitgeist in the company. Uh, uh, the company is now in a, a weird state because of the, you know, the the Rona and all of that. Mm -hmm. But in the course of it, we recently put out our first film. We made a video production of William Shakespeare's Macbeth, of which we are truly proud, sincerely proud. Uh, it was all CDC guidelines, an impossible thing. And with the cooperation and true faith of these crazy actors of mine, we were able to pull it off in a way that we, we take great pride in our product. I love it. And you're an executive director. Um, so what exactly does an executive director do for those who aren't familiar with the theater or what, what's the background of that? And also, what's your experience with the Caribbean American Theater? Because you're also involved with them. Mm, uh, an executive director, uh, it's one of the rare occasions in the world where you really get to be the boss of something. I, I get to make the decisions. What we're going to do, how we're going to do it, who's going to do it, how, uh, what we're going to spend on it. Uh, my father, who, I think it's because the, the, the holiday just passed, he gave me a piece of advice that's early in the business. He, when, he, when he realized that I really was going to do this, he said, if you're serious about this, if you're serious about this business, then you learn every job in this business. That way nobody can come to you with no bullshit. And <laughs> <laughs> that's how he talked. Yep. And I took it 
the heart. And even though I was working already, I was stayed, I was at this part of the stage. But as you know, there's 900 moving parts to every show. Mm -hmm. So I, I came out of what I knew. I went to the lighting board. I went to the sound board. I figured out how they built. I figured out how the costumes got sewed. And now uh, I can... We can do a thing like Orson Welles used to do, the auteur, where you get to make almost a, a, an artistic creation from your hands. Thank God for the cooperation and collaboration of good people. Caribbean American Repertory Theater. I met a fellow who was the executive director of that company, Mr. Rudolph Shaw, and he was thinking the same thing as me, which meant he was doing every job in the company. I took sympathy upon the brother because the kind of work he was doing was universally uplifting. It was there was no there was no demeaning of our people. It was an upliftment of our people in every endeavor. I first met him on Broadway, uh, playing Marcus Garvey in a play we did called The Children's Legacy. And he was so serious about it. When I realized he had a company, I realized why he looked so overworked. Uh, <laughs> and so when our company was not in production, I would assist with his company. And eventually we formed a collaborative partnership. So we produce shows more than, more than not together. So we have a, a strange ethnic mix, a, a wonderful set of voices and good resources for, for a couple of companies that have been around for a while. I love it. And it seems like you, you mentioned the, even the beautiful set that you worked on, how it was from the, the ceiling to the floor. What what draws you specifically to that element of theater, like the design and um, and uh, stage management? Because you also have experience with that. And stage managers, there's no stage manager, there's no show. They're the unsung heroes no of the theater. No show. Uh, that's, that was a... Uh, my, I like to construct. I like working with my hands. So when it when I first fell sideways into entertainment, it was from graphic design. I was, I was pursuing a career as a graphic designer and doing all right. Somebody asked me, uh, I'll say the name, Mr. Carl Clay mm -hmm. from Black Spectrum Theater had me to design graphic materials for a film that he was making, posters. And it was with uh, my favorite rapper, a fellow called Dougie Fresh, nice. who was making a movie with Carl Clay. And so I did graphic designs. But after a while, things had to get more intense, like there were rooms that needed decorating. And so I had a color sense, so I ended up doing some rooms. And one thing led to another. On that set, I met the late, great Eric Stevenson, who taught me how something can come from paper to reality. So I give credit. He's taught many guys, not just me. And uh, so you can see it in certain people's work when you look at it. You worked with one of the people that was you know, under his tutelage, the great Chris Cumberbatch, who designed the set for uh, Soldier's Play. Mm -hmm. uh, he had this thing of not making anything antiseptic. It should be dusty and, and have texture and feel real. And so I, I took to that kind of aesthetic. It's almost like, it's almost more being like a curator than just an artist. Uh, I, I enjoy that. I, I, I don't know. Some people are built for some parts of the business. If I had to do anything all the time, it might be maybe props or set design. I love that. And what's the most fun production you've been part of with all this, all these productions you've been blessed to be a part of? I can, I can tell you that show. We were, we were traveling with this show, Mama, I Want to Sing, the gospel musical. And we had been on tour. We, we'd done 33 cities in 36 days in Europe, uh, Vienna and Switzerland and Austria. And then we were in Japan and we were in... Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and you know, it's strange because in all those places, English is a second language, so we always work with subtitles, a, a big scroll at the top of the stage saying the words, so there'd be a delay in the, the laughter or sometimes in the reaction to the words that were said. We went to, I want to say, Kamagachi province in Japan with the show. And it just so happened, Brother Lord, that this is the home of not one, but two United States military bases. The crowd was filled almost primarily with black Americans 
who were coming to see a show from Harlem, far away from home. Oh. Their reactions were instantaneous and boisterous. And I have a thing that I do at the end, we do a shout, you know, because it's set in a church. Mm -hmm. And I play the lighting board. The lighting board there was so big that no one person could operate it. Two guys had to work it. And I play the buttons like a piano. So the music has a, it works with the sound and it hypnotizes people. I used to have these flashbacks from back in the club days. <laughs> it hypnotizes people. And for a minute, we turned that whole crowd, it had to be 2,000 people, into one thing. And they were moving together. And the, the choir was taking it up and the band was taking it up and we left doing a show. We had something else going on there. I, I won't say what it was, mm -hmm. but at the end of it, the, the Japanese technician, he looked at me and said, I will never use this instrument in the same way again. So maybe we give them a little Harlem flavor they will keep forever. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Influencing people overseas. That's great. Great, great stuff. What, what's the most valuable lesson that you've, you've uh, learned over your career? Would you say? There's this new talk that I hear all about learning from your failures. That's very much in the in the air now in conversations. Uh, what you what I've learned from that, you know, uh, these shows are full of very carefully made plans, and we we sketch everything and chew everything, and everything is put into a particular. We work months on this thing. And because it is not, theater is not an endeavor conducted by robots, human activity, frailty, change of mind come into play. And so you've got to react on the fly to that. And I found that more often than not, when we're in a situation where our plans have failed, our instantaneous visceral solution turns out to be better than what we planned. So what I learned is to trust yourself as an artist, that your plan was just that, and the experience is something different. If you're present in the moment, just what comes out of you is worthy. So even when you're alone and you're writing your play, don't think you have to structure it something to get, just crap it out, just push it out. Uh, my mentor once described the lady's dance as coming from her vagina, but she did not choreograph it. She gave it of herself. If you're an artist, just give yourself to it and don't fear whether or not it's good or not. I bet you it's good. I bet you it's better than you think. I love it. That visceral, visceral just connection and surrender to it. I love it. Um, theater living word obviously has a lot to do with the word, the spoken word, Shakespeare, all this kind of stuff. Your mother loved literature. So for you, what's the book that you've gifted the most in the past year? Particularly in 2020 when everything was going through, uh, it could be a fiction, nonfiction, what book or play? What book have you I'm gifted? The thing that I've, there's one book that I recommended to someone because, you know, we've been going through a lot of racial strife, if you want to call it strife. My takeaway from the pandemic might be different than almost anyone else's. What I've witnessed and I've seen a golden thread run through this period of time is that things are being repaired that were broken for a long time. It's almost like this pause was necessary for us to take a good, hard look around. We're telling stories that we've kept to ourselves. We're sharing history that might have been blurred. And we're taking steps that we were afraid to take before. Some, some right and some wrong. So uh, I think that it's critically important just to, I don't know, just to be real in your interactions, not only with the world, but with yourself as well. And to make sure that you are in the process of fixing what's broken, even if what's broken is you. 100%. And th what, which, which book did you um, give to oh, people? Oh, you know, that I, I went off on the thread. and That was beautiful. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was yeah. uh, from a book. <laughs> pastor says that, my pastor says that, uh, uh, you know, that, 
when I'm doing what I'm doing, he's sometimes when he's on the altar and he's preaching from his notes and he gets excited and then he's preaching from somewhere else. And uh, when I'm talking, that happens to me too. I get taken away. The book that I've most recommended is a book by Langston Hughes. It's called The Ways of White Folks. And it's not what you think it is. This man was a scholar of the human nature. And some things that we think are, are brand new are old problems that we have yet to fix or things that we have yet to recognize. I read an excellent piece this week from a, a staunch conservative who now realizes that he may have been misinformed about what it is about us and what it is about him. So if you want to read something and it's not something that just came out the other day and it's not it's not something that's hit to what's it's the classic. You may recognize yourself on either side of some of the interactions therein. And I'd recommend that you read it and govern yourself accordingly. I love Langston Hughes. That's that's um, amazing. I'm going to check it out. And um what are you currently working on or desire to work on next? Oh boy, we had just had a performance uh, last night uh, online with the Caribbean American Repertory Theater. We did Poets of poets and Playwrights of Power and Passion. My microphone's all damp when I describe the show. <laughs> uh, we had some Langston Hughes, in fact, and uh, some great stuff from uh, Claude McKay and uh, some rising poets from Nigeria. Uh, over the course of the summer, we hope to do just some light readings, maybe out at Kings Manor Park. Uh, I did some workshops with the, with the new CEO over there, and she's very amenable to theater and the arts. And in the fall, I have a new play uh, that I hope to produce again. It features a character that features a, uh, that's been played twice before by an actor that's a friend of both of ours, Mr. Fulton C. Hodges. Yep. Uh, he played a man who's already deceased twice, and I have intention to try to see what the life of this character was like before he passed away. He gets to play him live for a change. You know, Shakespeare always has dead characters who have plenty of lines, so mm -hmm. we, we're following in that <laughs> tradition. But there's some stories that are right from the neighborhood mm -hmm. that we want to try to tell. Uh, that's that's the secret big project of 2021. There's a, a new play that's coming. I love it. Where can people find out about that? Is it, it um, is there going to be, do you have like a mailing list for either of these theaters or how, how do people contact you? Then, uh, you know, you can, uh, we're on, uh, come to me. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, we're on YouTube, uh, Street Ethics, uh, Twitter, at Marlon Campbell. You can come to MarlonCampbell.com. TLW's new website launches on Friday of this week, and that is TLWshow.org. Uh, there's always something going on, and I hope you get to review. We have videos of some previous performances, so if you don't feel like Netflixing and chilling, <laughs> get some Prosecco and come and enjoy some theater of the living word. You might see some faces you know and a, a voice that reminds you of someone you know. And when you think of the word creative, Marlon, Who's the first person that comes to mind for you and why? You know, it's funny because uh, we used to not say the word. We used to think we didn't want to be like that. We want to be, I, I, I work with a partner, a tough guy, and he was a construction guy, so he didn't come from the art. So when everybody, somebody say creative, we say, oh, Lord, not one of these creative folks. We just got work to do. We, we, we don't have time for that. Uh, but that's a joke because he ended up being more creative than me in a lot of ways. The person who inspired that is who we met at that time. His name is Woody King. Yes. The leader, the, the just now retiring leader, the king of theater. Uh, he took a napkin and turned it into a, a legacy. He had an idea, and he's not unlike me. I know that he used to be climbing the ladder and swinging paintbrushes and doing all of these things. When I was young and very green, I was running up some stairs with a crate full of props, and he stopped. He said, you know, you don't look like a prop man. To me, you look like a producer. I thought the old man was crazy, and I hoped his check would clear. But little to know, 
they saw something that I didn't know could be possible. So in that same vein, uh, let us all go forward with that sort of thought. Um, I would like to promote uh, a brother that we both know, Brother Chris Cumberbatch, for his wonderful set design. There's also a brother that's he's stronger than uh, X-Men mutant and also was at the feet of Eric Stevenson. He's a set designer by the name of Harlan Penn. Mm -hmm. He's currently doing a lot of work for CBS because they couldn't let that talent roam free. But now and then, if we can snatch him down from the ether, he'll put together a set that you swear to God, you're in the place that the play is about. He built our set for Fences at the early part of 2020. It was our last live production for TLW. Mm -hmm. And when you sat down in there and we dimmed the lights, you left where you were and you went where he said to go and so i have to give props to those people woody for his vision but for making a place that feels like a place chris cumberbatch and harlan Penn. i love it and well we're kind of coming towards the end so you've you've locked you dropped your linkedin your instagram and all this kind of stuff where else can people connect with you if they are either if they're set designers listening they want to get into design or they're actors who want to get involved or audition for you or, or be mentored by you in turn? I'm, right on to, I'm on LinkedIn, but you can also come to the TLW page on Facebook. You can also write to TLWshow at gmail.com. We're always looking for new people. Uh, we work with one of the, again, one of the outcomes of the pandemic, the companies, at least out here in Southeast Queens, we have completely dismissed the idea of being in competition with one another in any way. We are part of a grand collaborative movement. And later on, when they write the tale of this time, they will say this is when they found Umoja, unity, and became stronger. So I, Carl Clay is my friend. He's putting on shows over there. I got to wait to, for him to finish with my actress so I can bring her over <laughs> here and put her in the 16th century. Then I send her down to the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning so she can be a griot. And we're all doing this thing, brother, all together. I love it. Well, much love and blessings. I appreciate this time with you, brother. And um, I'll see you around. Thanks for having me, Brother Lloyd. You, in yourself, are a shining talent. And anybody who is out there that has a chance to see this man out of his real life and into any character should take the opportunity to do so. I'm deeply impressed from the first time I saw you until right now to see you in your real persona. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Totally different from Ellis, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. <laughs>